So <coughs> this, this, this project is built between two communities, Ashington and um, an Aboriginal community in Australia. When you first heard about it, did that seem unusual? Was it a bit of a shock? Or how, how, what was your reaction to it? Well, I first heard about it from a reporter from one of the Sunday papers who basically was asking my thoughts on, on the issue and I wasn't sure what it was about but uh, when it was explained it was by the press that they thought there were striking similarities between uh, Aboriginal communities in, in Australia and Ashton. Um, I asked what those striking comparisons and similarities were and they said, you know, the way that you've been abandoned, the way that there's a, uh, in lots of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, l uh, low employment figures, high unemployment, low wages, basically as if Ashton had been discarded from society. And I was a little bit puzzled by that because I think that, although there might be some similarities, um, them similarities could be drawn from two different communities across the globe, anywhere where you wish, basically, to put a pin in the map. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay, that's good. Um, and one, one of the things about the two communities, one of the similarities that w we seem to pick up is what you just put your finger on there, which is a kind of a negative portrayal in the media. Do you think that that is inevitable? Do you think that... Uh, it's wrong. Do you think? You know, what, what's your reaction, firstly, maybe, to the way that Ashington is portrayed in the media? Well, Ashington, uh, for generations, has been demonised by the press. It was demonised when we had the biggest pit in, in Europe, when we had more than five thousand people working underground at one pit, and we had five pits in the next door and within within the boundaries of Ashington. Demonised then, and demonised since the closure of the industry. Uh, for, for various reasons, never being too kind to the people of Ashton, but that doesn't bother myself, it doesn't bother the people in Ashton because a fairly resilient bunch, whether it's the men, the women, or indeed the kids, we're quite proud of where we come from and we always understand our roots, which is very important. And uh, whatever people, particularly the media, threw at the people of Ashton, we dress ourselves down and come back again, and that's very important. And something that just popped into my head there is that media by and large is southeast centric do you think that in that portrayal is, is emerging um, something which is emblematic of that kind of north south divide well I th i'm sure there is listen there's people um in in parts of this country haven't got a clue uh of where the, the way of life in in mining communities uh up in the northeast or indeed uh, the shipbuilding in, in other parts of, of, of the north as well. I haven't got a clue, there's not an understanding of how ordinary people uh, work, how they live, how they survive, <coughs> how they enjoy life. And of course the struggles which uh, come along with that. And what, what's more, I'm not sure whether they're too concerned about that either. But uh, as I've said, uh, we understand it clearly. We're quite proud of all of, of the, the history, the traditions and the cultures which we have. And uh, we'll never ever surrender them for anybody. Yeah, you're absolutely right, because one of the things I picked up when I was up there is that pride in the region, and certainly in Ashington, pride in the town. And one of the things that we've picked up again, which might be similarities between the two communities, is that idea of the values of solidarity, equality, um, and uh, sticking together through thick and thin. Is, is that something you've perceived? Sticking together, solidarity, inequality um, are all measures of a, a decent society and it's normal life in, in Ashington. It's not something which people um, think of all the time. It's natural, it's normal from the people, uh, the townsfolk of Ashington, the surrounding areas, to act in, in that fashion, looking after each other, always making sure that your next door neighbours fine and okay, uh, looking after other people in the community, those who haven't got a voice, those who might be less well off, those who uh, dis may be disabled and cannot attract employment, those who uh, just simply cannot attract employment. It's a natural sort of feeling in, in, the, in, in the Ashton towns for a breed to, to look after each other. And it's, it's like runs through the blood uh, of people from our communities and natural solidarity. So, uh, 
it's not coincidental that this, this interview is taking place, what, three or four hundred yards from Parliament. As a man who comes from Ashington, as an MP representing that constituency, do you think that the way you've been brought up and your knowledge of that constituency enables you to empathise with their situation and other people's situations in working class areas more than, say, some of the people you work alongside in Parliament? I mean, obviously, if you're being brought up, uh, you know, from from the cradle, from birth, in an area, you know, a hugely work class area like like Ashton, then you've got the experience, you've got the knoll, you've got the, the living experiences, of not just yourself but people around you, and you've got a clear understand, understanding of what uh, people feel, what their aims, what their aspirations are what they want, how much they want, in what direction, what the support. So of course it does, it gives you a much better understanding, uh, having lived there all of your life, if to what people in, in the likes of Ashton actually want out of life. And you know, the people in Ashton do want the world, they want fairness, they want justice, um, and they, they just want a decent standard of living, and they want to be treated fairly, and is that not what everybody should want? Um, and currently, thinking from the uh, party in power is to reduce the state, is to reduce the burden of, on the state of people who are maybe less advantaged than, than some other people. And this has given rise to people pushing forward charities as a solution, putting forward philanthropy as a solution. For you in Ashington, is that a solution or wh where's the balance to be struck between these things? Well, I think First and foremost, Ashton, you know, people have always been the type of people who want to work. And it's up to politicians like myself to try and ensure that that work's available. Um, but there's, there's lots, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of people in this country who, for whatever reason, cannot work. Whether it's because of, of the, the, um, the state of mind, whether it's because of the fact that there isn't any employment available, could be a whole multitude of reasons. But the, the reality is, it's up to the state to provide uh, a safety net for, for those people who are not wishing to live a life of luxury. Who it, it's not a, a lifestyle choice, but it's because of economic and political situations that they find themselves unable to make ends meet. We live in a, in a country now, the sixth richest economy in the, in, in the world, where people who are working or relying on food banks, etc., to feed themselves and their families. And I think that that's an absolute disgrace. I think the money um, it, this country earns is, uh, needs to, we need to look at the way in which the wealth is distributed. It's distributed unfairly. And listen, what we should be doing is looking at those people um, who are really struggling to make ends meet first and foremost. And at this moment of time, as we speak, the government are looking to shave uh, 12 billion pounds off the welfare bill. That'll cause uh, absolute mayhem, havoc, extreme poverty for families, extreme poverty for children. And there's some people in my constituency, uh, some children uh, in, in some wards, two thirds of the children are living in poverty. Is that the sort of society we want to live in? Is that the sort of communities we want? to develop for the future. Of course it isn't. So that there's a huge role for the welfare state and to shave um, anything off at this point in time is obviously not heading in the right, right direction as far as I'm concerned. Okay, um, and in terms of the geographical location of Ashington, you know, it's how many miles from London is it? It's about 300 miles from London, 300 yes. miles from London. Probably closer to Scotland than it is to the south east. Well, it, it, sorry. Um, what, what I was going to go on to say is the people up there seem to be less concerned about their Englishness and more concerned that they were from Ashington, they were from Northumberland. So identity is it's an interesting thing. One of the things that the Aboriginal people said when they came over is we always thought we were just the English, but now we understand that there are regions and they have very different identities. And, and maybe someone from Northumbria sees himself as Northumbrian first and English second. I think that's probably fair to say. I think people from Ashton see themselves as Ashton people, then Northumbrian, uh, and then English, and uh, the same as people in Bellington would feel the same in New Billion. Uh, and there's a great, a great deal of thought put in the identity, identity of individuals. It's really, really important where you're from, where you come from, and uh, people are quite proud of that. 
So, I mean, that, that's not really an issue with regards to Englishness or whatever. We live uh, in Ashton, it's about maybe 60 miles from the Scottish border, and it's 300 miles from Ashington to, to London. So we are, you know, we're only a stone's throw away from the, uh, the, the Scottish borders. But isn't anybody thinks well more Scottish than we are English? We're English. We're Northumbrians, and we're from Ashton, and we are very, very distinct. It doesn't matter where you go in the country or when you travel abroad. When you speak with a dialect like mine, like people from Ashington, um, people know where you're from. Jackie Charlton. Bobby Charlton, that's what people say, and, 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 and everybody's quite proud of that, by the way. Um, it's interesting, I think, about identity, because often identity comes from your community. And in Ashington, for generations, certainly for hundreds of years, the community, the cohesion of the community was the mining industry. That has now vanished in, in Ashington. How do you maintain a cohesion in a community when the glue that kept it stuck together has disappeared? It's very difficult, it really is, because uh, the, the communities were built on coal, for coal, by coal miners. The reason Ashton exists is because of the, the, the mining industry. You know, it's you know, more than a century ago where people came from all over the country, um, all over the world, and so we had lots of nationalities coming to Washington as well to work in, 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 the, in the pits there. And of course, that held everybody together. But what it also did, I mean, everybody wasn't a miner, but what also it did was um, was breed people who, like we discussed before, who had a natural affinity to solidarity, uh, wanted to help each other. And it, it bred, that, bred that community spirit. That, that community spirit still is very tough because of the things, you know, because of the fact that we haven't got that one major employer. We've got a lot of social problems, a lot of economic problems. But at the, at the end of the day, when it, boil, when it, it all boils down, people of Ashton still do look after each other and we still are a fairly tight-knit community. Although everybody doesn't meet at the same place um, to, to work and, and, and make a living, uh, the, the community is still rather tight and looks after each other, which is, again, extremely, extremely important. And people are very proud of that fact. Something, something that just, just popped into my mind, that you, you don't have to ask, answer this if you don't want to, because it might be a little bit contentious, but... Um, I didn't know that area at all, really, until about a year ago when we started doing this project. And I went to Morpeth. Morpeth is, what, six, seven miles away from Washington? Morpeth seems to be quite an affluent, thriving community, which um, it, it seems very in stark contrast to Washington. Is there a reason behind that? Well, Morpeth, um, in the main, has always been one of the most affluent areas in the country. I think only two or three years ago it was voted nationally as one of the nicest places in the country to live. And I'm still very proud as the MP to represent them more with as a constituency. You know, I'm really blessed in many ways because I've got the, the affluent area of Morbeth and the surrounding areas and the, the area in the, the southeast of North London, Ashton, Bedlington, Chobbiton, Newbigin, Camus, Stakeford, Guitebost, um, which, which haven't got the rich pickings which Morbeth, Morbeth has. But it's a, it's, it's a diverse community. And I, I think that uh, that really serves me well because I've got the, a whole array of different uh, viewpoints in, in, in my constituency from these different areas. Well, one of the things which our Aboriginal uh, friends were talking about was their commitment to the land and their belief that they owned the land, which is one of the reasons, I think, why... Uh, there was so much anxiety caused when Captain Cook, as, as, as one Aboriginal lady said to me, Captain Cook and his crooks came over and stole our land. Um, and land seems to be important in Northumbria as well, but the land isn't owned by the people who work on it. It's, and, and, and for reasons going back generations, it's owned by, for lack of a better phrase, well, the rich landowners. How, how does that play out in the community? Well, the, the land mainly in North Humberland is owned by uh, two or three uh, very, very rich families, and it has been for generations. I don't think it bothers people. It, it's not an issue in, in North Humberland. It's not an issue, uh, certainly in, in, in my constituency, who owns the land. And, and what is uh, an issue is what they use that land for and make sure that it, it really should be in the best, best interest of the community and not something... Um, which can be used, uh, which the community aren't, aren't uh, 
um, in, in favour of. That, that's more of an issue. So I think it's different to, to the likes of the situation in America, the situation in, in Australia, uh, the way it is in Northumberland. It's not an issue who owns the land. There's a general acceptance that these people have been rich landowners and lands being passed through, whether it's the Duke of Northumberland or the Ridley family or whatever. Um, it, it's general acceptance. There isn't any resentment. I wouldn't have thought against that neither. I mean, it's not a case of all private land as theft. Um, it's, it's the same goes. I mean, what is interesting, actually, is when, when I've been driving around Ashington and the surrounding areas, is because the pits have closed down, there's actually now an awful lot of very beautiful natural areas that have been kind of um, created at the places where the pits were. So, you know, around the Woodhall area or, or around some of the pits. So, actually, it's a beautiful place to live, Ashington, really. Ashington's a, a very nice place to live, as is the, the whole of the North East, Northumberland, in, in my view in particular. But Ashington has got some fantastic themes. It's got the, the river, the Wandsbeck uh, River, which, which runs through the, the constituency. And you've got the, the, the park, which is fantastic, runs right to Sheepwash, one of the nicest parks you'll, you'll, you'll ever visit. You've got the Woodhorn Museum, and you've also got the Woodhorn um, Elizabeth Park, which is a fantastic park. Basically, the ponds of the old Woodhorn and Ashen Colliers pulled together. So we, we have got a, you know we we've got a, a lot which we're, we're terribly proud of. Um, it's not just a history; it's it's about you know, what's being done by the local authorities and, and, and what we've got to look forward to in the future as well. So I think this is probably my final question, which is um, if people watching this film and they don't know Ashington, they don't know its people, they don't know its culture and you had to kind of tell them about the uniqueness of the place and what makes it and what makes its people. How would you finally kind of sum the whole thing up? Well, I think Ashton is a place which has uh, suffered very difficult times whilst we had uh, good employment levels with the, the, the mining industry. Uh, it was a mining industry which shaped not just the northeast, not just Northumberland, but Ashton. Uh, that, that's cooled us running through the veins of almost everyone who lives in our area. There's a natural affinity with people to, to support each other. That's the culture to assist each other and help each other. And of course, there's been some rough times and of course, there's been tough times. And of course, it's classed by many as a tough, rough area. It perhaps it has been and perhaps it will be in the future. But the people are fantastic. One thing about the people of Ashton, they're very resilient and uh, they're very welcoming, very warm, very understanding. And uh, anybody who wanted to come to Ashton for whatever reason would, would say that in almost immediately. Anybody who comes to Ashton for the first time will always make reference to the fact that these people, uh, although they've had a difficult time uh, for uh, generations, uh, are very kind, very welcoming, and uh, it, it's not something which you get in other places. It's interesting because quite a lot of what you said then describes the Aboriginal community as well. <laughs> That, you know, that sense of, of welcoming, of warmth, of solidarity, and, and that, that idea of we've had better times before, but we're going to rise back and come back from where we are now. Well, I think that's, that, that, that's probably right. But again, I would say that that's probably... Um, you could pick two communities you know, across the globe, you know, hundreds of miles, if not thousands of miles away from the Aborigine community and away from Ashton, who will still have those striking um, sort of similarities. What it is, by the way, it's about, it, it's a class issue, really. It's about working class people who have got a different outlook on life. It's not about the community itself. It's about the working class issue internationally, globally, where people who have had to work for a living, who have uh, struggled and had hard times, but I'll, I'll always come through the other end. I think they've got a completely different set of values and understanding and a vision of the future than perhaps their uh, areas who are not so working class orientated. And I suppose, it, and finally, it's about being a decent human being. Well, I think what I've said uh, today, more or less, uh, is, is exactly that. It's about being honest. It's about being decent. It's about be, having values. It's about understanding your traditions and your history and your culture. Um, not wanting to get rid of them, but also look at the future and want to build a better future for yourselves and for your families and for your kids and for their kids' kids. But doing so, understanding your roots, where you come from, and also understanding where you want to be and not forgetting uh, why we were there in the first place.